good morning to everybody. I was uh, quite instrumental working with the team from the World Economic Forum to uh, put this issue on the agenda. And in fact, it's arguably the most important issue uh, for the next 10 to 20 years, one would say, for the Middle East and North Africa, and that is uh, the building the future middle class. The best form of security, if you think about it, is uh, economic prosperity, uh, not for a chosen few or an elite in the society, but inclusive growth that is uh, viable on its own merits despite the revenues that come in from, uh, for example, hydrocarbons. Uh, and that over-dependence that we often hear about, particularly within the Gulf Cooperation Council states. Now, a common and accepted yardstick is the pressure to create a certain level of jobs between now and 2020. I've covered this issue going back to uh, 2003 when the Arab Business Council, the World Economic Forum, got very involved with the issue of job creation. Uh, for the purposes of this debate, I'd like to include uh, Turkey in our measurement as well for the broader Middle East and North Africa and bring it all the way here to the, the host country uh, of uh, Morocco. So I'm going to use a benchmark. It's a high benchmark, but the, the need to create 100 million jobs by the year 2020 to tread water, to not add to the unemployment rate. I'm also going to use the benchmark for the purposes of our discussion uh, the latest numbers from the uh, Middle East North Africa economic snapshot from the International Monetary Fund, which puts the unemployment rate in the Middle East and North Africa at 11 percent. And again, another common benchmark that we use uh, in this region when covering it is that the youth unemployment level is at least double that. It's, it's actually much higher in some countries, well into the uh, 40 to 50 percent range, depending on what you're looking at. It's not surprising to find youth unemployment uh, at 20 to 25 percent. Just to lay the, the groundwork for the discussion here, we're going to have a roundtable discussion for about 35 to 40 minutes, and I want to open the floor to questions. When we do get to the questions, I ask you, because we're taping this for our CNN program, Marketplace Middle East, that you keep your questions very direct, identify who you are, and uh, allocate that question to one person on the panel. Uh, welcome to everybody on the panel. I appreciate you joining us. We intentionally brought two people from the Gulf states, uh, one minister from our host country, Morocco, and a business leader uh, of, uh, looking at the pan-regional basis. And it's a real pleasure to have uh, Lubna Olayan, who is a, a highly respected uh, business leader uh, from Saudi Arabia. What I'd like to do to start in terms of the panel, let's spend, if we can, a minute or two on how you see the intensity, the, the pressure, the building of the future middle class. Let's, let's frame the debate first that way. Joe, do you want to start us that way? Sure, yeah. Thank you, John. I, I would start by saying that the emergence of a strong and vibrant middle class in the MENA region is in the national interest of most governments in the region. And starting from that point, when you think about it, there are 100 million people today roughly between ages 15 and 29 in, in our region, again, in, you know, with the MENA definition. Uh, many of uh, whom will come to the workforce in the coming years. And this is often seen as a, or can be seen as a liability in the short term, but in fact it holds great potential for all these countries in the long term. If you remember yesterday, one of the panelists was commenting on the negative implication of an aging population in Japan. And so m my belief is that, again, this youth bulge, if you want, of 100 million people at the, uh, within this age structure hold great potential for the region. Now, having said that, if you couple this uh, observation with the unemployment observation that you've made, that the uh, youth unemployment stands at twice the national average in most uh, these uh, countries, you couple this with still strong population growth in our part of the world compared, for instance, to OECD uh, countries, uh, if left unaddressed, this potential will go to waste, and I would call it almost like a ticking time bomb, economic time bomb. So this is something that we've got to get right, and it's in the national self-interest of everyone in the region. So uh, in the big picture, if you're defining this region and you're trying to attract foreign direct investment, we have to move the conversation from this fast growth population uh, from a liability to an asset, and that's not happening today in your view, Joe? No, it is starting to happen. The, the, the problem is this is an awfully complex uh, issue. Uh, there is no magic stick to, uh, you know, to just decree the, the emergence or the rise of a middle uh, income, uh, middle income tier or middle income class. And so it's really about 
lots of things, lots of policies coming together at the same time. That's, that's where the complexity, frankly, uh, frankly lies. There Sheikh, is no silver bullet. Thank you. Sheikh Ahmed, uh, if you, there's a number of different measurements, and that's part of the challenge when framing the debate here. But if I look at purchasing power parity, Bahrain ranks 32, according to the IMF 2009 survey, uh, with the per capita income around $27,000, again, depending on how you measure that. What's the progress made? What's been the concrete progress for Bahrain in this effort of a redistribution of wealth in the island state? Well, I'll pick up from a point that Joe just mentioned, and it is looking at no one solution works for all countries. There are many different tools in our toolkit to tackle the problem of building uh, the middle income or maybe even middle income uh, and higher. Uh, the challenge for us has always been uh, what is needed for each country. For us, it was creating a vision, a vision. Our Vision 2030 document is a vision that took time and consultation with many different bodies uh, around Bahrain to understand what the country wants, what, do we, what can we do and what we want to do uh, as a nation. And I think that's an important challenge. Once we built that vision document, we were able to develop six-year plans for different ministries that then were incorporated in our budget cycles. Uh, it's a consultation process with, with many different bodies. It's understanding what we want to do and then to take us forward. But what we felt was important was providing access to capital, investing even further in education, and making sure we had the infrastructure to support business at the lower end. Small enterprises, small businesses, development bank, even smaller banks that look at micro loans, and creating the chain that will help an individual from micro business all the way to small business until they are ready to be uh, taken over by commercial banking, that was an important link. And creating the training facilities through uh, some of the programs we introduced that allowed money for investment in training to make sure that our people are ready for the jobs that are actually out there. The challenge now is no longer thinking within a country. It is the ability to think how can we compete as a nation regionally and globally. And that's how we see the world evolving. How are you benchmarking Bahrain? And Mr. Barak, I'd like to pose that question for Morocco. But internally, how are you benchmarking your countries to say we are making progress on the development of a middle class? First, Bahrain. We, we look, first of all, at uh, benchmarking uh, to the region and to the world in terms of what is best practice out there. Uh, we have no room for local laws or, or local regulations. We've got to see what is out there in terms of benchmarking. Uh, we follow uh, what the World Economic Forum does in terms of research. We look at the World Bank IMF work. Uh, we definitely follow what the G20 does in terms of how the new structures and finance uh, and other bodies are actually evolving. I think that's very important in how the world will, will look in the next 10 years. And, and we need to understand how the world is changing and what our role needs to change too so that we are ready for, for the challenge. Education definitely is key. Access to finance, training are, are two other important things. I'm not saying these are the only ones. For us in Bahrain, we saw this as very important. But as I said, for every country, there is a different set of policy uh, elements that are needed to be implemented to make sure that that country can keep the challenge. Good. You brought up a number of things I want to come back to uh, after our opening comments mm -hmm. regards to education as well and the broader influence of the G20 on the Middle East and North Am Africa. Uh, Minister Baraka, how are you benchmarking Morocco? I know the efforts that's been underway by, by King Mohammed VI to broaden out the economy, to attract foreign direct, uh, direct investment, and to build a tourism uh, sector. There's been an effort over the last 10 years to broaden the base of foreign direct investment and broaden the sectors that can create wealth. How are you benchmarking yourselves in, in Morocco? I think that uh, for our country, it's, uh, the most important is to maintain a very higher uh, rate of growth. And as you know, we had uh, uh, the average of rate of growth is about 5% a year. And uh, how to have better wealth for our uh, population is first of all to know that uh, this uh, growth, uh, the beneficiaries of the growth are the poor then we reduce poverty, and we reduce the poverty from 
2004 uh, until 2008 from 14% uh, to uh, 9%. Second thing is to have uh, a, d a better uh, middle class. And ha now I, I, I would like to, to explain that the middle class is not only a problem of revenue. The, as you know, Morocco had uh, a revenue per, per capita who increased 4% a year. But we think that the most important is to have this uh, feeling of to be uh, into this middle class, because that means that we have hope to have a better life and to have a better future for our, our people. And uh, the statistics say that the middle class in Morocco have been enlarged to about 50% of our population. 50%, working from a baseline of what before 10 years ago? It, they said it was about uh, 40%. That means there is an increase, very important increase, thanks to, f first of all, to creating jobs, because the, in the 19s, the rate of unemployment it was about 14%. Now the rate of unemployment in July 2010 is about 8%. Second thing is uh, to have uh, better skills. And uh, as you know, Morocco had uh, have been diversified his uh, economy with new sectors like uh, electronics, like uh, aeronautics, like nanotechnology now, and uh, of course automotive with the uh, investments of Renault, uh, who will uh, produce about 400,000 vehicles, uh, cars a year in 2012. All that give us the opportunity to have a better uh, productivity and of course a better growth. Good. Uh, Lubna Loyan, what do you think is at the onset here of this debate, what is the most important thing today? Is it defining what we want to see within a middle class, whether it's Saudi Arabia or a country like Morocco or Egypt? Well, I think uh, it would be good to define the middle class, and uh, some people don't like middle class. They like middle income rather than middle class. But if we, uh, and I think we've all looked into the definition of the middle class, and it's uh, numerous ones we have seen. But uh, one of, uh, uh, for us to say is, I think for a society is uh, the middle class is the one nowadays with at least university education. This is what I would, uh, and this, is, this uh, takes us to the value of education and training and the quality of education. Uh, the ability to access uh, uh, or the, uh, the, uh, to access funds, um, uh, the, having a good job and uh, uh, an opportunity to contribute to the sector, uh, access to healthcare, I think, is very important. So whether through insurance or uh, and and in particular, this important is so they, we don't in case of a serious illness. They don't fall back to poverty. So there are many definitions of what constitute a middle person in the middle class. And uh, for, uh, to be able, uh, also home ownership is, a, is, a, is an important category of uh, middle class. Good. So let's drill into various subjects that have been brought in this first round of uh, opening comments. One of the things that stands out uh, in the broader Middle East and North Africa is that the poverty rate is still extraordinarily high at nearly 40 percent. That, that's not acceptable in 2010 with the sort of wealth that we have throughout the region. And again, depending on the measurement, that's a very high poverty rate, and it's not in each one of the different countries. But if we look at the totality of the Middle East and North Africa, a poverty rate of up to 40 percent in some markets is very high. Joe, do you want to, to jump in on why that still is so persistent today? Well, if, if you think about it, uh, take the example of uh, China recent, you know, in recent years, it does take several years in a row of sustained economic growth at levels of you know, 8, 10, and 12 percent year, year in, year out to have a chance to lift people out of poverty. And if you think about the traits of our economies, of regional economies, for a long time, for instance, if you take some of the GCC countries, the state of the economy was very much linked to oil prices in, in the 80s and 90s. And the economies went up and down together with oil prices. So economic diversification was one reason 
why, for instance, over the, over the decades, if you want, this did not happen, uh, or this emergence of the middle class did not happen. But that's not the only reason. Another reason has been historically in many of these countries the lack of private sector uh, participation or strong participation in the local economies. The fact that entrepreneurship was not only frowned upon, but entrepreneurs could do not, could not have access to, uh, uh, to financing, for instance, which is a, a point that, uh, that you made, Sheikh, uh, Sheikh Ahmed. There are other reasons as well that I think that we can drill into education. Education is probably the major, the, in my eyes, the most important factor and turning this uh, situation around, and we could probably go down and... Well, let's, let's interject here. Uh, there's not a lack of will on education. If you look at the amount of money being spent in some markets, is as high as 30% of GDP on education, but is it the, the right education? Ludma, do, do you want to start? Yes. <clears throat> no, I think uh, after, with our uh, youth and uh, the huge uh, youth and the population growth, Governments uh, are focusing on education. Private sector is focusing on education. But I think what I would like to focus on is I think we all re uh, recognize that we should focus on the quality of education, on uh, teachers' training, on getting the right teachers, uh, concentrate more on the curriculum and the teachers rather than the infrastructure surrounding their education. And we've seen recently focus on centers of excellence. I mean, uh, universities in the Arab world do not rank among the top 400 universities in the world. And uh, Saudi Arabia have done one attempt in Kaust University, which is a uh, research institute. We need a lot of more centers of excellence. Would we say we're starting at the top in the Middle East and North Africa and, and worrying about higher education when it actually has to get to the grassroots? <clears throat> you have to start somewhere. And maybe it's easier to start at the top in some Easier, country. but is it more effective but is the question. It, it is effective if for you to get into a very good university, you would have to have a good standing from school. So you uh, slowly will force the, uh, you will naturally force the schools, the uh, high schools, to try to meet more entrance into universities. So it's a natural way of forcing the change. What's the approach in Morocco, uh, Minister? I would like, first of all, to say that uh, I agree with uh, Mrs. Olaya that uh, it's very important to invest in, soft, in software and, of course, in human capital and in training. But I think that we have, at the same time, to link the education and the program higher, the higher education and the sectorial strategies. Because we all know that, for example, in Morocco, we know exactly what kind of uh, sectors we would like to promote and to invest into, and what kind of training we need to have these skills, to have a better productivity, and to be into our labor market. Then, with the, the strategies we, we put, we have strategy in industry, in services, in agriculture, in fishery, and all these strategies, we know exactly what kind of people can work in 2020, in 2015, and we are preparing people for that. Second thing we did, I think it's very important, it's about when we have a big foreign investment in Morocco, like Renault, we decide to invest with Renault in training, we will have a, a Renault Academy to train people for automotive uh, constructions. Then I think it's this kind of, uh, of work we can do for, for the future. Good. Uh, Joe, before I go to you, I wanted to bring in uh, Sheikh Ahmed here. I know there's been a great effort within Bahrain to match the skill set at the high end of the market to the demand of those investors who have chosen Bahrain to use as their base for the Gulf and the broader Middle East. Are you matching correctly at this stage to create the middle class? When we started the process, our unemployment rate was very high, it was double digit. Today it's 3.6%, even though uh, we have gone through the worst economic crisis uh, that the world has seen. Uh, the challenge was very simple, uh, how to match the skills and how to improve education. The mandate was taken over by our economic development board and the process was, was very straightforward. Again, consulting with the people on the ground and looking at best practice around the world. And building a process 
where we can encourage people to learn and give them the skills on how to further learn uh, on two tracks. One is academic learning, which is very important for people who are still in schools. And the second is to make sure that we are building this, uh, the capacity for people to, to learn on the job, to improve themselves, and to be able to match those training programs and skills with jobs on the ground, whether present jobs or future created jobs because of the capacity that's on the ground. And I think uh, we have seen the change in, in unemployment rate. Of course, that and the economic growth that we've had because of the improved oil prices have helped reduce our unemployment rate. Joe, you wanted to make a point on education. Yeah. Where did you want to, to point yeah. to? I just wanted to add that while it was the right thing to do to start with modernizing the education system at the higher education level for the reasons that were cited, I think now we are at a stage, John, where we need to work on both ends of the spectrum. Uh, turning around an, an entire education system is a matter of a generation or two at least. It doesn't get done in two or three years. And so things like computer literacy, English fluency, uh, mathematics, uh, encouraging a mind to be inquisitive, so the method of teaching are best ingrained, ingrained in the early stages of schooling. And so now we, I, I don't think we have the luxury to just focus on higher education. We've really got to work at, you know, at, both, uh, at both ends. Good. I want to bring in the political element because we can't ignore it. Uh, we have elections coming up in Egypt. We have elections in Jordan. We had a parliamentary elections in, in Bahrain. What are those elections pointing to, and which role does job creation and the creation of a middle class play into the election cycle now, and the results that we saw in Bahrain, for example, Sheikh Ahmed? Well, the elections is a process of democracy where we have uh, a legislative body uh, that we work with as an executive branch on, in government on uh, getting the budget discussed and passed uh, and uh, the process of creating laws. Um, my, my question is a little bit different if I can pinpoint this because it's important. The development of a middle class, is it playing out in the election results that we saw, for example, in Bahrain? Is it that sort of pressure that's leading to the results that we're seeing within the uh, legislative body? I think it is um, our government's interest and any government's interest to make sure that the economic prosperity actually is, is re uh, reaches every citizen in the country. Uh, we see this today in Western countries where uh, the challenge of creating economic growth is there, creating jobs are there. Uh, we've been tackling this for many years. When I mentioned earlier that we've dealt with the unemployment, we've maintained trend and growth at about 6.5%. Through the crisis, we went down last year to 3.1%. Uh, we're back to about 4 is our expectation for 2010. Uh, we believe that it is our mandate as government to make sure that we continue process, uh, the, peop uh, the process of growth. Uh, the people on the ground definitely are looking to improve themselves. It is our job with them to consult on how. And I, I remember in my opening remarks, I mentioned in developing economic theory, one has got to consult on what is capable and what is needed by a country to grow. There might be some social, some uh, other restrictions within a country of what they want to do as a people. Uh, consultation has become a very important part of what we do. Uh, we need to make sure that the people are on board in the new ideas. Yes, there are ideas that are tough sell, but it is important that we, we create this forum for debate and discussion between, between government and the people through our legislative body, which is the, the parliament, uh, to make sure that we, we uh, come with the right laws, the right tools, and the right set of ideas to, to continue economic growth. Okay, and our goal is to reach that economic uh, growth rate, which is our trend. Good. In fact, the IMF is suggesting, and Minister, I'll come back to you, the IMF is suggesting that you need at least 6.5% growth region-wide to make a serious dent in the creation of a middle class and a serious dent in the unemployment rate. Is that a, that's a very tough benchmark to hit. Yes, uh, about this point, uh, I would like to say that uh, with, the, with the crisis, as you know, our partners like Europe, for example, from Morocco, had the reduction of their potential of growth, about 0.5% about all the, peop all the countries of the OECD. <coughs> that means that, of course, there's an impact in our potential of growth. But I think, and uh, it's to, to have uh, and to 
to have the possibility to maintain and to have a rate of growth about 6% or 7%, integration of our countries, of the MENA region, is very important. I will give you one point. First of all, the non-Maghreb, the non-construction of the Maghreb, costs two points of GDP a year for our countries. That means that in, if we to open the border with Algeria and to have this Maghreb created, we can double the income per capita for our people in seven years. That's why I think that integration, integration, economic integration for our countries are very important and can give us the opportunity to have better internal demand, domestic demand, and thanks to that to have a better rate of growth because we know, we all know that, for example, for Europe, we can't have a rate of growth more than 2% in two, three, in, in the few years uh, after. So th this is one thing I do want to pick up on, the ability to have inter-Arab trade, both within the GCC and the broader Middle East and North Africa. Can we move beyond the rhetoric, because the building blocks are there, Lubna, to action to remove non-tariff barriers to trade? Yes, I think there is a, a, a lot of interest in moving into uh, uh, interregional trade. I, I don't the get the sense of urgency. Let me ask it a little bit differently. 2005, the creation of the greater free, uh, no, sorry, in 2005, you saw the creation of the greater uh, Arab Free Trade Association and this market, that potential that was there. If we we're going to measure that in 2010, one would say we haven't seen a lot of progress. No, uh, you're right. We haven't seen too much progress, and there's a lot of uh, obstacles we have to remove, a lot of bureaucracy that stays in the way, and uh, uh, these are things we do have uh, to handle. And trade, as we all know, does create jobs and uh, does improve. Uh, 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 the, the uh, I mean, will will bring more people. Uh, to, to the middle class. But what we uh, really hear, uh, what I would like to say here, if, if I may, is um, entrepreneurship really can add also to the middle class. If we look and we learn from other countries, if we learn from Brazil, what Brazil has done, uh, uh, they have added 30 million people to the middle class and re uh, reduced the poverty level uh, quite a bit, and that's due to entrepreneurship. If we try to learn from other countries how they have tackled their middle class, if we try to learn from Korea, for example, Korea uh, increased and bolstered its middle class by education. So we have spoken quite extensively about education, about training, and, uh, and, and we do, I mean, uh, Singapore has one of the, uh, some of the best training schools, non-government, and, and the time spent and the uh, money spent into these training schools and the quality of the training is phenomenal. And this is what we need is to bring that type of a job. And of course, foreign direct investments coming in, encouraging uh, a, a high level foreign direct investment to the countries can help. S Saudi Arabia has climbed the ranks in terms of attracting foreign direct investment. Is it making a difference in the creation of, this, of the middle class in the country? Uh, it is making a difference in job creation. To measure whether it's making a difference in the middle class uh, and the actual measurements would be uh, for us to see. But definitely we see. I mean, we see some of the joint ventures of SABIC uh, coming in. Uh, you know, Exxon and Shell are one of the largest investors in the country. and. Uh, I guess the technical knowledge and the improvements and the requirements of job training has improved quite a bit in there. I want to go to this point of the building blocks that we have available to enhance the middle class. And one would argue, at least within the Gulf states, having a single currency would lower some of the non-tariff barriers to trade. Sheikh Ahmed, we've been talking about a single currency. The UAE is not part of that process. Can we get past those barriers between the countries to get something done as, at the core of the Gulf that could perhaps be spread throughout the Middle East, a single currency? We are, we are committed to the single currency and working towards it as four states uh, that are committed to the single currency. Not, not very encouraging, four out of six, which doesn't lead us to believe it's going to be a broader initiative in the next 10 to 20 years. Well, I think the door is always open uh, for the other two. 
uh, what, is, uh, what is important to note is to see that today we understand the challenges that, our, uh, that countries are dealing with in monetary and fiscal uh, policies. Um, one angle maybe we should tackle upon, and maybe it's my chance to, to plug my field, is when, uh, when even looking at building middle income or middle class, uh, we should look at monetary policy, we should look at fiscal policy. Single currency is part of that process, but uh, what is important is there is an increased need and an effort uh, to understand better how to position our monetary policy and fiscal policy to, to help economic growth. Uh, we understood that in our budget cycle of 2009 or 10 by, by going counter-cyclical in spending like some other countries uh, to make sure that we maintain growth. And that's why we kept positive growth uh, in our economy in the last, uh, well, last year and this year. Uh, and we're looking to fix that over the next... Uh, uh, the, I'm having to deal with the fly here, but yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, the challenge of that. I thought you were going to pull out a magic wand. Here, really. <laughs> uh, but uh, basically, uh, the, the challenge for, uh, for every country now is how to develop monetary policy tools and fiscal policy tools uh, to make sure that we, uh, that we understand how to deal with the challenges and also help create the middle income uh, um, class, if we, if we like. Uh, because that is um, certainly a part of the process. Uh, Joe, to create the opportunity for foreign direct investors, one would like to look at this market of, say, 250 to 300 million people in the broader Middle East and North Africa. We're well off that concept of looking at this region as a single market. What needs to happen to do so? I think, you know, moving beyond the rhetoric, uh, everyone has been talking about uh, integration. I remember, for instance, and I'm sure you remember, Sheikh Ahmad, the discussion on uh, electricity interconnection within the GCC that, you know, was first uh, talked about in the, in the 70s. Uh, so there are lots of ideas. It's, uh, it's the political will that, uh, frankly, needs to translate those ideas into, uh, in, into actions and, uh, and initiatives. Uh, I don't think this needs to be studied a lot or anal overanalyzed. Uh, I think everyone knows what needs to be done. It's just a matter of picking up a few things and running with them. Right? Good. So let's, let's go around the table on this one because I think this is an essential question. Uh, are we tackling this creation of the middle class with a sense of urgency that is needed knowing the competitive landscape within the G20 structure, for example? I mean, <clears throat> should we be doing more? Yes. Uh, but are we tackling it? Yes. I think... Uh, uh, I mean, both the private sector and the government sector have realized the urgency of tackling this problem, tackling the youth bulge, employment, education. Uh, if I may uh, sidetrack here, I think when we talk about unemployment, we talk about the overall average, but women unemployment throughout the whole Arab world is much larger, and uh, that is something recent statistics I've had throughout the MENA region, not only in the Gulf, is, I mean, the average is around 40, and maybe here, Joe, you can uh, uh, help out. That is a large number of a sector that we do. And there is attention being put on job creations, or maybe should be there some, uh, uh, I'm not too much of a quota person, but should be there uh, incentives for companies and incentives to hire more women. Okay. I'd like to come back to that as a separate subject because it's a very important one is the role of women in the workforce, particularly in the Gulf states. But let, let's go to the, the issue of the urgency. You, you addressed it briefly here, but are we taking that sense of the unemployment rate in the region and applying all the policy tools that are necessary, knowing how competitive the landscape is outside the Middle East as well? Let's start with you, and I'd like to go right across <coughs> the table on that particular topic. But the unemployment of women is very important for this. No we doubt. shouldn't put it aside. No, but I want to come back to it. Okay. Uh, uh, yes, I think uh, uh, I'm, uh, we are all uh, aware of the necessity of creating jobs, and all efforts are being done uh, uh, to do. Should we, do be, should we be doing more? Most definitely. Uh, and uh, job creation is what is important to keep us uh, prosperous uh, uh, in the long term. We also have to make sure we don't fall back from where we are because we, ha we can see how uh, middle income can be really decimated due to political, uh, uh, what ha uh, for example, Lebanon, 
the war in Lebanon has really uh, hit uh, terribly the middle class. And uh, we also can see if there is a recession or uh, that. Uh, so we have also to guard against factors that can take us back. So th there is concern in your part that we're backsliding with that lack of a sense of urgency in some markets. Uh, Backsliding, I'm not, um, uh, I'm not sure we are uh, backsliding. I think uh, we should do more than that. Yes, I would agree with that. Great. Minister Baraka? Yes. Uh, I think that, uh, first of all, uh, we all know and we think that the middle class is very important for us. First of all, middle class represents uh, so so social stability. It represents represent economic efficiency. It presents uh, hope for the future. And uh, more than that, uh, that means that if we, have, if we have good middle class, that means that for the young people, they can, and the, the social lift works, that they can have a better life, a better level of life. That's why uh, the king give us uh, to work in the government to enlarge the middle class. Mm. And uh, we, we put a strategy with two uh, big measures. The first is to enhance middle class and to maintain the purchase of the middle class and to have better revenue thanks to reduction of uh, the income uh, tax, thanks to uh, having more uh, social um, uh, guarantees and uh, protection. And the third thing is uh, to have, of course, to create more jobs. And uh, at the, second, uh, the second point of, of this strategy is to fight poverty. And thanks to the initiative, National Initiative of Human Development, uh, leaders by, by, leaded by, by the King, we, we could and all the public policies are, have the same goals, is to, to work to have better human development in our country mm. and, uh, of course, to fight uh, poverty. Good. How do you define the safety net? And I'd like to have, ask Sheikh Ahmed the same. <coughs> this is important in the protection of the middle class. Exactly. What would you say are the two to three key essential tools within the safety net of Morocco today to develop that middle class? Yes, about the, about the safety, uh, what we have now in Morocco, we have now, um, uh, what's its name, it's insurance, of medical insurance for all, for, uh, for the people. We have it, we just began this year for poor people, give them the opportunity to have uh, social protection. And we are working uh, on, uh, uh, to, for people who lose her, uh, her work, her, her job, their job, we can give them the opportunity to maintain their revenue during uh, six months. Then uh, we are working on uh, uh, enhancing this uh, social protection for our, our people and to maintain the level of the middle class in our country. Good. Sheikh Ahmed, has it been necessary to put the tools or ingredients in place for a safety net within Bahrain as well? I think that's critically important, but if I may take just a minute to talk about the G20. Uh, the G20 represents countries with a GDP of 85% of the GDP of the world. But today we have 187 countries as members of the World Bank. So if we take out uh, 20 countries, we're left with 167 countries with about 15% of the GDP of the world. But it's 15% uh, of the GDP of the world, 167 countries, they need to be more included in the process. I think that's a, a very important message and a point. So what sort of pressure is that applying to those that don't represent 85% of the economy? What are you looking at to say, within Bahrain to develop the middle class, I see what the G20 is doing, this is what I'd like to do within our country? The challenge that uh, I'm trying to, to explain is as the G20 is introducing changes in how things are done, whether fiscal, monetary, looking at uh, fuel subsidy or other programs, that they are trying to tackle. Um, it's important to also understand how the other smaller countries will be affected by any changes uh, in regulations or any changes at the institutions the other institutions are looking at. I think that's, that's critically important. Looking at the safety net in Bahrain, we've, uh, we've created unemployment benefits, which we felt is important. That was 
The first element in actually tackling unemployment is, is getting the right numbers. To make sure we get the right numbers, we started paying people who are unemployed and offering them job opportunities. This way we, we can actually state that we know the true unemployed because we pay them money if they are unemployed and we give them job opportunities and we offer them training. So making sure you have unemployment benefits, making sure that you can actually train the people and offer them jobs to make sure that you create uh, a safety net. For people who are unable to work, there is of course social services and programs related to that to make sure that maybe within the family they could help them come up with, with better means to improve, to improve their, their capacity. Other uh, most important mm. program I think that would help people uh, who are earning less money, low income, is, is a program we call Tamkeen, which is actually a program that was uh, introduced by, by His Royal Highness Sir Crown Prince uh, through, through a law, of course, that went through our uh, uh, judicial system and, uh, and legislative body. Uh, the law is very straightforward. Uh, basically, there is uh, a fee for every foreign worker that goes into a fund. Uh, that fund is actually spent on training and enabling people, local people, to be able to uh, get better skill sets to earn more through better jobs. Uh, and I think that's a very important program in enabling the middle class. Uh, we saw the process in Singapore, it was implemented in Bahrain a few years ago, and the process is working very well with companies and with individuals to, to increase the skills that they currently have today to get better jobs. Good. Joe, if I can have you bring your mic a little bit closer to it, would be sure. great. I wanted to, to pick up here, and Sheikh Ahmed makes a very interesting point. What are the best examples as a Singapore or a South Korea, a, a U.S. or European model that would apply to the Middle East on accelerating the creation of the middle class? I don't think, as usual, uh, the easy answer is there is no single model that uh, you know, the Middle Eastern uh, countries can, can learn from, but it's rather looking at various models and picking up what's, uh, what's, uh, what's best. And it is a combination of all the elements that we've talked about. There is the social safety net aspects uh, that some countries have built, and Sheikh Ahmad, I think, listed uh, most, of, uh, uh, most of those. Uh, there is the aspect of uh, letting the private capital or private sector loose in, in creating jobs, SME creation, SME, you know, small and medium enterprises support, access to financing for entrepreneurs is absolutely key. And, and so you, you, you see different countries experimenting with, with different pieces of that, uh, of that, puzzle, uh, of that puzzle. The trick, uh, uh, John, is to stay the course on those. It is easy to not backslide, but uh, not press on in, you know, when, uh, when, when the economies are in, are in trouble or are growing less or when there's <coughs> less of a fiscal uh, surplus. The real key is to stay the course for a sustained period of time. Only, only this really, and again, China brings a great example of, uh, of lifting, I've read somewhere, between 40 and 50 million, million people out of poverty every single year. And the reason they're able to do that is, uh, is you know, sustained strong growth of 9 to 10% 10 years in a, uh, in a row. Uh, just to add, I, I totally agree with everything Joe said, but just to add one more point is retraining. We have a lot of jobs, sometimes too many of jobs, whether teachers or, uh, or, or uh, 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 administrative workers, that we would really have to take them and retrain them so they can contribute more to the sector. And I think other than training is should maybe we should look at retraining to have them more fit into what is required into the economy. So you're, you're suggesting that it's modernizing the current workforce by retraining those that are in specific areas of the economy? Yeah, I mean, we, we have a, a lot of abundance of school teachers and a lot of school teachers are not finding jobs. Should we try to retrain them? to see, I mean, there are more need maybe for financial analysts to try to see what the society needs and retrain, and that's an opportunity that also should be looked at. Good. I promise you I'd come back to this role of the, the, the female in the workforce, and this is a, a huge issue within the Gulf states in particular. You're removing at least half of your economic development or potential economic development by not having women in some markets work. Uh, let's tackle it head on. What's being done to readdress this cultural barrier uh, to females in the workforce? And I'll uh, approach Sheikh Ahmed afterwards, please. Well, uh, 
I mean, it is very obvious that if 50% of the population are not allowed to contribute, it's, you're already at a disadvantage and you can't uh, get to where you want to go. So uh, there is a role for the females and, the fema uh, uh, and opportunities to work. Historically, in my country, the, uh, in Saudi Arabia, the job opportunities have been in education and the health care. And so now we are expanding to open more the job opportunity outside these areas. And we are seeing tremendous change in the last, I would say, five, six years of women participation. We're seeing the private sector are hiring women uh, in Saudi Arabia. Of course, we have to abide by certain restrictions. But overall, I see, I think one of the challenges also we see is that women are uh, in, in, in Saudi Arabia and other countries, I think, in the Arab world, more into university degrees than men. So that also you have a higher uh, education of women and uh, we, that we would have to create more jobs for. And there was one study I was reading that uh, some of the unemployment maybe is for a higher, because of a higher education, the highest, the more unemployment. So we're educating the women in our work to be prepared for the workforce, we're just not using it. So they're, they're getting the higher education, uh, they're going abroad in many instances, but we're just not tapping into that resource. Yeah. And, uh, but, I mean, steps are being taken, and if we look through our, the GCC countries, the percentage of uh, non-nationals working there, vis-a-vis uh, -vis the women available, I think we can look at it and see uh, there is a natural fit here. Good. Sheikh Ahmed, you had your hand up. You want to address it? I'll come back to Minister yes. Baraka. Uh, I don't think a nation can succeed with 50% of its capacity underutilized. Uh, there are two elements to this. Um, in Bahrain, we have 37% of the workforce in the financial services as, as women, 25% of the total workforce. I still think we can do more. Uh, we are examining and looking very closely at gender-based budgeting. And uh, that's a politically correct term, I guess, that, uh, that we can use. Um, that says the, the budget will look at issues related to women and men uh, to specifically target programs that will serve both women and men within, within uh, the government budget. Uh, it's an important element to enable the economy uh, to even produce uh, more through utilizing women more in the workforce. But uh, I just wanted to echo uh, the message that uh, uh, we need to empower women and make sure that uh, they are actually out there working. The, the grades we see in schools now and in universities, women are much higher than men. And I remember when I was governor of the Central Bank, we sent a delegation for a training course of, of nine women. And the person on the other side called me and said, I thought you were joking, but when I saw them participate, they're all very capable. And I see no reason uh, to distinguish based on, based on gender in, in jobs and in promotion. I think that's, uh, uh, that actually makes the society stronger, much stronger. Hmm. How does that play out in Morocco, yes, Minister? I think that the most important thing is to rehabilitate women in society. Hmm. And I think in Morocco we begin with the Mudouana, the change of uh, the, the law of uh, the, the Mudouana, and who give women more rights. And uh, we have now women in politics, in economics, in entrepreneurship. We have women uh, studying and, of course, uh, we, we promote women thanks to uh, the um, education, like, uh, like they said. It's very important, I think. And the, 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 if, we, if we, in Morocco, what, uh, what we are trying to do is to have women in all the aspects of the life. And uh, we can talk about, uh, for example, uh, local, uh, uh, in, in the local um, elections in 2009, we had 12% 12, uh, 12 or 5% who are women. In uh, 2003, there was only 0.5%. Mm. That means that women are more present in society, in politics, and of course, in other areas. Good. A couple of things I wanted to, to touch upon, and then I'd like to go to the audience uh, for some questions. I'll ask the lights to go up when we do so. But the role of Big Brother, uh, there's a tendency, particularly in the Gulf states where the, the energy wealth is, to look over the shoulder and say, well, Big Brother will provide the job for me, 
uh, in government and not the private sector. And this has always been a trap since the 1970s. Are we getting past this trap that the government or Big Brother will look after us and provide a government job just to make sure the employment numbers look better? Yes. Uh, well, I think, uh, yes, uh, in Saudi Arabia, job creation has been more in the private sector in the last 10 years than in the government sector. But the mentality is there that the government will look for us in, in, in terms maybe of health care, in terms of, uh, but not in terms of job creation, in terms of uh, uh, housing and uh, helping in house loans and all this. But uh, job creation, I would say, mostly is coming from the private sector. And there's a change in mentality that it's not going to be the government providing the job, not just in Saudi Arabia, but I'm thinking in the broader region as well? Yes, I think there is uh, uh, the set that uh, really it is entrepreneurship, it's in a new uh, uh, companies coming up and uh, creation, and it's mostly private sector led. I don't think it is mostly relying on the government in job creation. Good. Minister? And yes. Sheikh Ahmed after? Of course, uh, there's the problem. We know that uh, people and uh, the young people want to work in administration. And that's why it's very important for us, like, as you know, that uh, job creation is more in the private sector than in the public sector. The, the, the administration represents only about 10% of the job creation in all the country. That means that, uh, of course, we can't provide all the people who want to, to, to work into administration. And that's why we are trying, first of all, to change mentality, to change uh, uh, the, uh, the program of education in universities, to prepare people to work in private sector and not to work in administration. That's, I think, the, the big change. And of course, we are working with, uh, we have uh, some experiences to, to promote entrepreneurship and culture of entrepreneurship in our country. And we begin in, uh, in primary education because we think that it's at school what we have to change the, the mind of our people. So the seeds of change are planted at, at the primary school level now exactly. within Morocco to change that mentality. Yeah, we try to, to explain that it's very important to be responsible and to have their the, the, the creating of, uh, of their enterprise. Good. Sheikh Ahmed, you wanted to address this issue yourself. Thank you. Yes, I, I think just very briefly, uh, at the lower end jobs, I think the, the challenge is still that the government jobs are, are more appealing. Uh, we're seeing a trend of beginning of change, but we're definitely not there yet. Uh, I think what is important is uh, focusing on productivity. And I think that's what uh, His Excellency the Minister was, was referring to. As we focus more and more on productivity within government and, and uh, private sector, as an economy starts lo uh, looking at how can we be more productive, uh, I think jobs, whether in government or private sector, will start looking more and more similar. Good. I'd like to touch upon this issue, which I think is a very important one, and that is the role of the sovereign wealth funds, particularly in the Gulf states, because of the blessing of, in the last 18 months, 70 to $80 oil. Now, there's been a tendency to take the oil wealth and splash it out on trophy properties and not focus on regional or even domestic development of the middle class. Is that starting to change? The strategies of the sovereign wealth funds starting to change with the money staying closer to home but targeted at development? Joe? Yeah, I mean, uh, again, countries are acting uh, quite differently. I mean, in Abu Dhabi, for instance, you are seeing some of those foreign investments uh, really aimed at transferring back some key technologies that can benefit the economic development of, 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 uh, of the country of, uh, of origin. In other cases, it is really, uh, you know, you can look at it from a financial investment perspective, you know, maybe acquiring some trophy uh, properties, but with the goal of generating financial, ret financial returns uh, that can be used as a buffer for, you know, for f or fund for future generations. So I think the situation is quite, uh, uh, the starting point is quite different. Fr from what we see uh, now, the trend is evolving more towards the domestic economic development. There are more uh, investments being made with the aim of uh, generating uh, wealth and job creation, uh, technology transfers. Within. So that would be, I think, the, the incre increasingly the trend. Good. It, through the downturn, Saudi Arabia is quite proud of the way it handled its investments 
in terms of the international portfolio and the lack of losses within its portfolio. What's been the strategy, not just for Saudi Arabia, but your views, Lubna, on this issue uh, of the sovereign wealth funds and how we see the change of strategy over the last four to five years? Uh, well, Saudi Arabia is, I guess, one of a uh, uh, few countries that really didn't have a sovereign wealth fund to invest outside. Uh, uh, most of the funds are invested under SAMA, and SAMA handles it. But, I mean, we have a couple of funds, PIF and other funds, which their investments have been mostly locally and supporting local industry. Uh, and, and I think more and more activities are happening. Recently, we've seen PIF investing in, it was all announced on, with Aramco projects, huge uh, investments. And it, the focus has been and continues to be to create jobs. The difference dynamics is because among the GCC countries, Saudi Arabia is the most populous of all the GCC countries. And we have, and it's one of the highest population growth. So there has to be focus on job creation and investments from the government. And it's a truly a government-private sector uh, uh, partnership in trying to see and invest in jobs that do create. And I think the government is very sensitive about that issue in particular. Good, so what's the most effective way, uh, we target this to the Gulf, what's the most effective way to take the blessing of the natural resources and that revenue and apply it to developing the middle class at a faster pace. Sheikh Ahmed? Uh, I go back to my vision comment. We've got to know where we are, where we want to go, and how do we want to get there. And there are different policy levers and policy tools that could be used. Uh, we, we just talked about uh, sovereign wealth funds. Uh, fiscal policy is very important. Private sector enablement is very important. Uh, how do we manage all those different policies together to make sure that we are targeting a growth rate uh, that is in line with what is needed to create full employment or near full employment, making sure also that we're not overdoing it and getting inflation in the way uh, and creating uh, a lot of challenges uh, in that area. And I think one area we haven't maybe tackled enough, again, I go back to monetary and fiscal, and I think that's what what is critically important to make sure that there is uh, stability, medium and long term in any economy, is to make sure that the policy levers are managed well, there is more coordination within the different bodies uh, within a country. No longer we could set a budget without understanding what your monetary levers are, what your um, banking systems, the quality of assets and how they are managing their business, are they keeping up with the best practice and prudential regulation, and so on and so on. So making sure that you've got that coordinating body or communication strategy within a country uh, to control all these different policy levers is critically important. Okay, I wanted to follow up, and this is a very important issue, and I'd see if I can get very candid answers as a result of this. When does the slower creation of a middle class and the very high unemployment rate amongst the youth become a security issue? Minister? Or, or is it already a security issue? I mean, if you don't have an active youth population that's going to be the next generation of your middle class, if you don't deal with it with a sense of urgency, does it become a problem in the next five to ten years? Uh, of, of course. I think it's, uh, as you know, it's very important for us, for our countries, to have better middle class, to enlarge the middle class, and to give our young people a hope to have a better life and a better level of life. I think about these points, that uh, middle class is very important, like I said, for uh, our uh, social uh, stability, but more than that, if we, we have to have this middle class to be involved in democracy, because it's, middle class is very important for, to, moder to modernize the society and to have democracy in our country and to have more democracy in, in our countries. And the third thing is, uh, as you know, we have, uh, there, there is a lot of problems in, in our, our region. Then we think then, because middle class is first of all to be involved in some, and to create in some values, values of stability, values of tolerance, values of uh, opening, and values of, uh, of productivity, and, if, and efficiency. And uh, we think that we have to, in, to invest more in human capital 
and to do our best to have better and to enlarge the middle class, to give stability to our countries, but to modernize and to have better rates of growth for our countries. Good. Lubna, do you want to jump on this? Yes, I think... Uh, you need to have that microphone a little bit closer. Thanks. <clears throat> yes, I think the, uh, uh, the concern uh, whether uh, unemployment for the youth is there and will it lead to social instability? Of course it will. And uh, if the question is, are the governments aware and focusing on this? Most definitely, because it's a very sensitive area. So uh, uh, definitely this is an area of concern for all. You know, one point we did not touch on is creating middle class across the Arab world. Uh, for example, I mean, it just dawned on me, a lot of uh, jobs have been created, middle class jobs in Dubai for other, other Arab nationals. So we are seeing mm. job, uh, inter-regional middle class job cre creations taking place. And that is something that is really helping the Arab world overall. So. So that's changed a lot in the last four to five years specifically. Sheikh Ahmed, back to my original point about uh, security. Obviously, you're a member of the cabinet. You, you see this as a, as a real issue in which uh, to maintain that sort of vision you have in Bahrain to create the, the middle class wealth as a security issue. And it is a political need to give every citizen the chance for employment to improve themselves and um, to create a family and to see economic growth uh, trickle down to that individual. Economic growth that doesn't trickle down to every individual does not mean anything to the people that, that don't get any benefits from that wealth. Uh, it is an important challenge for us to make sure that whatever we do uh, actually trickles down to the average individual on the street. Um, to us, dealing with, with, uh, with parliament and dealing with the public and, uh, in, a, in a democracy means that understanding what society wants and how to put it in a, in a policy tool that achieves that. There are challenges from time to time where long-term discipline, fiscal discipline, and, and uh, making sure that we are thinking medium and long-term versus very short-term policies. That's where the debate is. It's usually a very lively debate, uh, but uh, usually we tend to, to reach an agreement to what is good for the long-term of the country. But definitely, all uh, that we have to do has to trickle down to every citizen. They've got to see what it means to them and their own family. Good. Let's turn the lights on if we can, because it's hard to see, and we've got a lot of hands that are going up. If we can get the microphones. I, I do need to see people. I ask you, because we have about 15 minutes for this uh, uh, area of discussion, identify yourself, and then direct it to one of the panel members, if I may. Who has a microphone there? Okay, please. You can stand up so the camera can capture you as well. Uh, my name is Mohamed Bouchdir. Uh, so, sorry, Mohamed, not, not to interrupt you. Can we do, I can't, if we can get more lights on the front, if it's possible, it would be great. If not, we'll, we'll live with it. Thanks. Please. Uh, my name is Mohamed Boujdir. I'm uh, a Moroccan from uh, New York City, uh, USA. My question uh, is uh, for all the panel. Uh, everybody on the panel agree, seems to agree that education is a key component in the economical growth and hence in the narrowing of the gap uh, between the, middle, the classes. My question is in the MENA region and in Morocco in particular, the education is provided by two different systems, the for-profit private sector and the uh, public sector. Uh, the challenge here is that we created a system with two speeds and two skills outcomes. I'd like to know what are the governments doing to provide the opportunity for, for the uh, underprivileged uh, population to have access to uh, uh, the private sector, assuming that the private sector provides, uh, uh, you know, additional uh, skills such as soft skills that Thank are you. not provided in the private, in, Good. in the public. Thank you very much. Joe, can I have you tackle it and then maybe Sheikh Ahmed, but is there a danger of a two-speed education system within uh, the Middle East, the private sector souped up and ready to go, and the state that Lubna talked about getting retrained in time to serve the greater population? Yeah. I think, first of all, this situation of having, you know, two, two tracks for education exists in many, many countries in the region. It's not only specific to, uh, to Morocco. Uh, if, if, you see, if you look at it from a spending perspective, the spending on physical infrastructure when it comes to, you know, schools, uh, uh, universities, uh, is, is, there, is there, you know, in most, uh, in most places. The 
key change that needs to happen is, and I think it's, it's been commented on by the panelists, is uh, the focus now on the qualitative side of the education system. Better, you know, spending on teachers, retraining, uh, performance evaluation. I mean, we're seeing some very interesting experiments in, in, in Qatar, in, in, uh, in Abu Dhabi, in, in Dubai, for instance, of evaluating the performance of teachers, something totally unheard of, you know, in our part of, uh, of the world. So now most of the attention needs to be uh, really spent on, 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 the on the quality side of, uh, of education, not just on buildings and, uh, and infrastructure. Good. We had some hands up. If I can get a microphone to this gentleman and then the person back there afterwards, yeah? My name is Fernando Rimers. I'm a professor of education at Harvard University. My question is for Minister Khalifa and for Mrs. Olayan. All of the panelists have talked about the importance of substantial education reform to create this middle class. And the ambitions for education reform are of a very different order than the targets of the past. We're talking about serious improvements of quality, serious enhancement of the relevance of education, training a very different kind of teacher. It seems to me that it's unlikely that those challenges will be met by the current institutions of education. For example, to produce a very different kind of teacher, it would seem to me that this is not a task that the existing schools of education are up to, that we would need to create new collaboratives, maybe uh, collaborative efforts between schools of education, business, engineering, combining universities and the private sector, back to the leveraging effect of universities, which can be terrific in terms of improving K through 12, that is going to require a different kind of leadership on the part of university leaders to get the universities seriously to engage in developing curriculum and teacher training. Is there the right kind of leadership in the sector, both public and private, to bring about these kinds of very transformative changes? Brazil, which was mentioned, for example, mobilized a coalition of business leaders who decided to achieve um, synergies by leaving aside what were small and unintegrated projects and really come nationally into a coalition of business leaders working with governments to produce those changes. Is there that leadership available in the sector, in the region, and if not, what would it take to produce it? Well, I think there is a commitment from the private sector to, to tackle this problem, and it is essential for the survival of the private sector and for the thriving of the private sector. and, and by doing so, uh, we will t we're tackling the thriving of the middle, econo uh, middle class and the middle income. So there definitely there is. So there's pressure now from business leaders such as yourself within the country to say this is not meeting our requirements or skill sets needed? I think uh, uh, this is an area where definitely it's a public-private section uh, collaboration, as you, as you have said. And the private sector is recognizing that there is tremendous need for this to happen. Now, uh, the question, and, and I, the, the, is, is the government and uh, the role of the government in this? I have to say there has been tremendous change in, in, in the government view and mentality of tackling this problem. Uh, are we both doing what we should be doing uh, per, to perfection? Definitely not. We are improving, we're learning, and we're trying to learn from what other countries are trying to do. Good. Sheikh Ahmed? Uh, I think the most important thing is not just the industry getting committed. I think politically we've got to be committed. So in Bahrain, uh, His Royal Highness the Crown Prince is personally committed on education. We have our most senior deputy prime minister chairing um, a committee that looks at education. So whether it's uh, teacher pay, uh, training, um, setting up the standards body, making sure that we, we build quality in, in what we teach the students, uh, it's, it's all being done. Uh, can we have harmonization in all the schools and make them all set a standard? I think that's very difficult. What we can do is make sure that they reach certain minimums um, and then leave room for individual schools. Because I've seen reports on government schools, and even within government schools, there is differences in the quality of education because it's how uh, the school is actually managing its own affairs. Um, so can you standardize? It's very difficult. But can you maintain certain minimums? I think that's very important. Uh, even in the United States, all, not all universities are alike. There's a huge, huge uh, difference between different universities. But is there political will, commitment? Yes. Is the money being put forward? Yes. Are the standards and, and uh, education uh, bodies and teachers being looked at very closely and being helped to achieve the targets? Yes. I'm being very brief because of time. No, it's okay. Do we have a question there, please? My name is uh, Jamal Din Talib. I'm from Sharq Al-Awsat newspaper. 
My question is to you, Mr. Defterius, and to the panel. Don't you think it is ironic when we are discussing the prospect of the middle class in the MENA region that we are actually witnessing the slow death, if I may say so, the slow death of the middle class in the advanced countries. USA, for example, the income of the middle class has almost or still stagnated since 1980. UK is almost the same. Sure. What is your take? Well, I can uh, provide my uh, sense of analysis. Um, and I'm sure Joe would agree with me on this uh, because I'm sure he has his head in this sort of space. Uh, Sheikh Ahmed talked about the, the shift uh, from the G7 in a very rapid uh, time frame in the last two to three years to quickly to the G20. And I don't think it was insignificant at the last IMF board meeting that the shareholder rights have been divided uh, to represent the growth that we've been talking about and the tilt to the east to include China, India, Southeast Asia, and I may add uh, the Middle East and North Africa with Saudi Arabia and Turkey at the table. Um, I personally think, uh, and I'm an American speaking, that the next 25 years are going to belong to the east. And the, that's why it is extremely important for the Middle East and North Africa to address this issue of development of the middle class so it can harness that growth, uh, not so much coming from Europe or the United States anymore, but the growth that's going to be coming uh, from these, this triangle of growth, if I can put it that way, uh, China, India, Southeast Asia, as a huge opportunity uh, for the Middle East going forward. I, uh, Joe, I think you would agree with that no, because the opportunity for the Middle East now is not necessarily to look at its traditional trade partners, which have been in the West, but to look at new trade partners, which would be in that triangle of growth uh, for the future. We had a question in the back corner, if I may. That's okay. I'll Terry. come to you right after. I didn't see you, but I'll, I'll make sure I get you. Terry Taminen from Pegasus Capital Advisors. I wanted to ask the panel what their thoughts were about sustainability, the topic of our opening plenary yesterday. Uh, the region has been known here for some time for resource extraction. And as one thinks about developing industries and a middle class, uh, there would, would certainly be a temptation to just provide more jobs for the service industry and the various industries that are serving more resource extraction in this region. But at some point, the music stops, and that's not sustainable. Uh, Sheikh Khalifa mentioned a, a sustainability vision for Bahrain. But I wondered what some of the other panelists uh, feel about this notion of the possible tension between uh, taking sort of short-term growth opportunities around resource extraction versus long-term economic development of industries that are likely to be here for the next 50 to 100 years. Okay, that's a, that's a phenomenal question on the diversification. Minister Baraka. Yes, uh, about diversification, I would like to say, uh, and about uh, sustainable uh, development, that Morocco decides to invest in renewable energy. As you know, in 2020, we will have 2,000 megawatts of solar energy and 2,000 megawatts of uh, windy energy. That means that in 2020, we will have 42% of our needs will be produced thanks to renewable energy. Second thing, we invest in alimentary security because it's very important for our region. And uh, we have a plan of uh, what we, uh, his name is Moroccan, Green Morocco, and uh, to have a better um, uh, rentability in, uh, in food, food in, uh, security. And the third thing is we are working about uh, of course, uh, environment and water, preserving water, because it's one of big problem we have to face in the future, in the, in the, the future years in the region. That's why we're trying, first of all, to have modern, modernizing, using water in Morocco, saving water, and to have better productivity of our water. And at the end, uh, about uh, our diversification, we are investing in uh, um, add-value uh, sectors, higher add-value sectors, like electronics, like uh, automotive, but like uh, nanotechnology. We just began here in Morocco, and that gave us, with phosphate and other areas, more possibility to have better competitivity and uh, to be more uh, involved into uh, the world economy. Lubni, do you want to add? Uh, I, I, I've seen the diversification in Saudi Arabia linked 
very much so to natural resources and into petrochemicals and down the food chain, but is this the right strategy, do you feel, for diversification? Yes. Uh, uh, I mean, it, it, is, uh, it is a strategy the government has been taking. There is also has been recent discussion into solar energy, into other forms of energy. Uh, one of our biggest challenge is also our dependence on uh, water, and uh, 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 which is another, other than the energy, is one of our uh, challenges looking forward. But there has been a focus by the government to diversify and look into uh, sustaining the economy on uh, other than purely oil. Sure. We launched our show three years ago, and I would say I, I know that the creation of the middle class is a huge issue and the youth unemployment, but nobody can really argue with the efforts that are underway to diversify at a pretty rapid pace. I mean, uh, Abu Dhabi took an investment in a very large chip operation, and they benchmarked to have their own plant on the ground in Abu Dhabi by 2014 or 2015, uh, only uh, 12 months after the initial investment. So it is a sign. You had a microphone here. Thanks. Uh, thank you. We'll take two more questions. We had one I'm here Muslim. in the center. Yeah, perfect. Please. Uh, my name is Yasmin. I'm from Egypt. And I'm here with the Global Changemakers Network from the British Council. I have two things to say. The first thing is to answer a question about the security. As a young person, not having access to funds and not having access to proper education creates frustration and creates a lot of time that I don't know what to do with. So what do you turn for is to whether drugs or extremism, hmm. which then affects your point, Minister, about stability. So it is a very pressing um, security issue, I agree with that. The second thing I wanted to say uh, about uh, gender equality, because I work at a women's rights organization, numbers of improvement can be misleading, so let's not fall into this trap. Because things, it's always easy to say things are improving, but they're not reaching equality yet. And I think, as an indicator in the business sector, we can see the WEF panels here. How many women and how many men are talking on the panels, the ratio of men and women is not equal. It's not even close to equal. Like, and it's always like the same women talking in the same panels. So let's, let's really, um, don't you think it's an issue? How many men in the hall and how many women is important? And this is the World Economic Forum. So I think it's a great indicator and a representative of how the business world is. It's not about that women have entered the fields. It's about how many women and what are they doing? What are the obstacles they are facing compared to men? I think it's an important thing to look at. Thank you. Great. Thanks for the uh, input. We had a microphone here. Thanks. Thank Hi, you. thank you very much. Zulfi Haidari from HPG Private Equity in Dubai. Um, I didn't hear anything about the scale, or the size of the talent pool in the GCC states in particular. And the question is to Sheikh Ahmed. Uh, given the size of the populations in the Gulf and the reliance on foreign talent, despite, the small, um, the, despite youth unemployment, isn't there a need to change uh, laws to attract and retain foreign talent in the Gulf states, and is there any, are there any plans to do so in Bahrain? Hmm. Interesting. You have Bahrainization, which has been an effort to, to increase the employment at the high end of the market in, in Bahrain uh, recently. Do you think it, you need to retain foreign talent and, at the same time, train your workforce, your domestic workforce? Can you get the balance? Um, we believe, and I'll speak specifically first about financial services, that uh, foreign talent is an important ingredient in the success of financial services because it helps you um, understand the world, what are the challenges, what's going on. In every new sector, uh, you would definitely see at the beginning a huge number of foreign workers at every level, from CEO all the way down um, to technical expert staff. As time goes on, we train more and more Bahrainis, and that's ultimately the goal. Uh, do we believe that a healthy percentage of foreign expertise in every sector is important? Yes, uh, because it, it um, increases the challenge within that sector and it increases the capacity within each sector to understand what the needs are for Bahrain and what the needs are uh, to export our products, whether they're financial services or others, to other regions of the world. Um, but retaining foreign workforce is actually done by what jobs you offer them. And what jobs you offer them is what the industry needs to attract them at a certain point in time because of what the economic competition or what is available to them as opportunities in other parts of the world. Uh, will we have a government policy to attract foreign workers? 
uh, I don't see that as something necessary. But within every, within every industry or sector, they will do what is necessary to create that mix of competitiveness in the workforce that they see fit. Okay, can I follow up quickly? This effort for Bahrainization, is it a, a clear effort to nudge out the foreign worker in time? This is, is a question a, that's been brought up time and time again. It is a clear effort to make sure that Bahraini's capacities and capabilities um, are, are enhanced and actually developed and that they can bet, bet, get better and better opportunities as time goes on. Uh, if the economy is continuing to grow, then the need for foreign workforce will always be there. Uh, are we looking at specific jobs and saying these jobs, uh, we need to have Bahrainis instead of foreigners? That's not ultimately the goal. The goal is what is the maximum potential that I can take an individual man and woman in Bahrain? How can I help them reach that potential? Uh, that's the challenge that I see for Bahrainization. Perfect. The gentleman in the back had his, uh, this will take that as the last question. Sorry, thanks for your patience back there. I did see you. Thanks. Thanks, John, for giving me the chance. My name is Ali Tamimi. I work for Hewlett Packard in Saudi Arabia. My question is about IT and information technology. I didn't hear any of the panelists discuss, discussing how can information technology help the cause of middle class grow it, nurture it. So I would like to hear from the panelists, Mrs. Good. Thank First. you. It's been, a, uh, it's been a huge job creator in Silicon Valley, and it's spread into different uh, clusters around the world. Is it being maximized in the kingdom? Uh, uh, I think it has been, um, and uh, we, we, we see women's involvement in the role for, uh, force in uh, information technology and the access of technology, because a lot of women can work from the home, given the cultural differences, you can have them uh, being involved uh, in that. So yes, technology has been uh, working. Also, it's an enhancement to the improvement of efficiency. And what you need to a thriving middle class is to have more efficient uh, 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 resources available. So yes, technology, and you're right, we did not cover it here. Minister? Yes, of course. It's a big issue here. I know you're, you're trying to create uh, exactly. this sort of clusters uh, in Morocco. Yeah, we, we have a plan for clusters here in Morocco. And at the same time, we have a plan whose name is Numeric 2013 to uh, have to be more involved into uh, uh, technology, new technology. And, uh, and uh, I, I would like to say that when we talk about productivity, when we talk about prof prof uh, efficiency, of course, we talk about information technologies. And we think that it's the future. We are investing a lot into these kinds of technologies because we think that thanks to that, we ha give the opportunity first to be more competitive and to give the opportunity to our people to have a better life. Good. Thanks. On that note, I, I want to give a nice round of applause to the panel for taking almost everything we threw at you. And many thanks for the uh, cooperation and participation from the floor. We apologize for the late start. It was just a technical issue, but I appreciate your patience. Thank